Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's event on administering Social Security, featuring former Social Security Commissioner Andrew Saul and AEI's own Mark Warshawski, uh, former Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy at SSA. My name is Matt Whitinger. I am a Rowe Scholar in Poverty Studies here at AEI. I previously worked for over two decades on the staff of the House Committee on Ways and Means, including serving on both its subcommittee on Social Security and also as the longtime staff director of the subcommittee that deals with, among other things, the SSI program that's administered by the Social Security Administration. Social Security provides old age, survivor, and disability insurance benefits to 65 million individuals, including 50 million retired workers and their dependents, 9 million disabled workers and their dependents, and nearly 6 million survivors uh, of deceased workers. SSA also administers the SSI program, benefiting another seven plus million low-income disabled children, disabled adults, and seniors. In 2022, over $1.2 trillion in OASDI benefits will be paid out, supported by current payroll taxes on workers, as well as Social Security trust funds and other revenues. The latest trustees report suggests the trust funds will be depleted by 2035, so the long run, which is rapidly becoming the short run, is filled with financial challenges for the agency. SSI, which is supported by federal general revenues, provides around $60 billion in additional assistance, making it one of the country's largest welfare programs. That all reflects how Social Security is about much more than just retirement benefits, including by offering significant protection from poverty and other ills to disabled workers and their families. Proper administering benefits each month to some 70 million recipients is a massive challenge, as we will discuss today in our conversation about the past, present, and future of the agency. We're fortunate to be joined today by two distinguished experts on those administrative challenges, along with recent efforts to improve SSA operations. Andrew Saul was the Commissioner of Social Security Administration from June 2019 until July 2021. From 2002 to 2011, he served as chair of the Federal Thrift Investment Board, which administers the Thrift Savings Plan for military and federal employees. In addition to his federal service, Mr. Saul has served as vice chairman and chairman of the Finance Committee of the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority and as vice chairman of the Mount Sinai Health System, among other positions. He also has extensive experience in the private sector, including managing two large publicly traded retail apparel chains for two decades. Mr. Saul is a graduate of the Wharton School of Finance and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Mark Wachowski is the Searle Fellow here at AEI, where he focuses on Social Security and retirement issues, pensions, long-term care, and disability insurance. Before joining AEI, he served as Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy at SSA. He previously served as a member of the Social Security Advisory Board, as Vice Chairman of the Federal Commission on Long-Term Care, and as the Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. He also has held senior positions at the Federal Reserve Board, the IRS, TIAA-CREF uh, Institute, and George Mason University's Mercatus Center. He testifies often before Congress, is the author of, or the editor of eight books, uh, and is widely published in academic journals and the popular press. Mark has a PhD in economics from Harvard University and a BA in economics from Northwestern University. So our conversation will cover their accomplishments while at the agency, specifically their efforts to improve the experience of beneficiaries and modernize agency regulations. We'll also review structural impediments to progress, including during the recent pandemic. And Mr. Saul will discuss his termination as commissioner and action taken by the Biden administration less than halfway into his six-year term and the problematic precedents that were set by that decision. Our conversation will last for roughly the next hour, followed by a few questions from our audience and viewers online as time permits. If you'd like to submit a question, you can do so on Twitter by using hashtag Social Security AEI, or simply by emailing a question to John Mantis at john, J-O-H-N dot M-A-N-T-U-S at A-E-I dot org. Again, that's J-O-H-N dot M-A-N-T-U-S at A-E-I dot org. Don't worry if you're in the room, the microphone will come around and find you. Um, and we will wrap that all up by about 5.15. So with that, let's get started. So Andrew, first question for you. Um, I don't know about you, but I grew up wanting to be the center fielder for the Chicago Cubs. I don't think anybody grows up thinking they're gonna be the social security commissioner. Uh, what's that job like? What, what are the nuts and bolts of that? What do you do exactly? And what was your agenda going into that position? So first of all, I'd like to thank AEI and Matt 
for letting me tell, tell the story of my two and a half years at the Social Security Administration. Um, when I was confirmed and I took over as Commissioner of Social Security, the thing I felt that we could do that would make the most um, impact on the beneficiaries and over a hundred million people, as Matt said, in the United States was improve the customer service. There are many areas which you, many of you being experts in the field, know about where I think we could do a much better, much better job in servicing the beneficiaries. So that was my stated goal. It's what we spent our time on and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we did as the afternoon unfolds. Um, we had a motto at the Social Security Administration when I came in was the following. Every decision you make must be made in the interest of the beneficiaries. And that is something we had signs all over the agency. It was in parted into all the key members of the management team because that was the essence of what I wanted to accomplish at the Social Security Administration. Uh, at, when we took over, and before I go any further, I want to make it very clear. We, the Social Security Administration has many very dedicated employees that love the agency, spent their lives there, many of them, and really care about the customer and the beneficiary. Obviously, when you have 100,000 employees, not everybody's like that, but the majority, we had a culture there that was really something, and you can't negate that. And any manager that comes in really has to understand that's a big part of the success and how that agency's been able to operate with poor systems, and, and not the financial support that it really needs to service that many people. So the employees really deserve a lot of congratulations for what they've done, and especially during the pandemic, and I don't wanna take away from that. But when I came in there on the other side, I found a situation that to me was intolerable. We had an abuse of the telework this is pre-COVID now, I want you to know. This is not uh, after COVID and during COVID when so many employees went to work from home. And that was understandable as a national disaster. But prior to that, at the Social Security Administration, people weren't working. The telework was being abused. There wasn't any productivity control on the employees, so nobody really knew what was happening. For example, we had security guards, and I don't mean to single out the security guards, but security guards doing telework. People that were in the front line in the offices were doing telework. It's ridiculous. That's not where they had to be. They had to be in the office to service the customer. So the first thing we did uh, was to reform telework. And I have to tell you that we probably cut out 75% of the telework. There were certain job classifications we no longer permitted it. Other job classifications, um, we cut back the amount of telework they did. The government was being abused. There was just no question. If you've ever been to the Social Security Administration, I walked in there the first day and I looked at this huge place, nine million square feet of office space. I wondered where everybody was. Well, they said to me, but they work from home. They're working from home. That's fine in a limited way, but this was out of control. The other thing in order to prove, improve the service, we put together a great management team. And this is not political people either. Almost everybody, with the exception of one or two, one sitting next to me, who was very capable, as, as Mark was introduced, was the head of the policy shop at the Social Security Administration. But almost everybody else that was there, other than myself and my deputy, were Korea people. And we changed a lot of the people who were there. And I found that when we looked into the agency, there were many young people, many people that really 
wanted a chance to be management. And we had 12 deputy commissioners, I think, of Mark said 10 or 12 deputy commissioners reporting to me and my deputy, and they were great. I told them when I left, we have a management team here now, a lot of young people, and maybe not the most experienced, but boy, smart, willing to work hard, and what we were accomplishing there was amazing. And I said to them, I said, you know, you guys, you could run one of the biggest Fortune 500 companies, pick the one you want, you guys could run it. And uh, we put together really a great team. So, in, uh, I know you want to go on yep. to, 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 uh, to answer you. The most important thing was servicing the beneficiary. And that's what we dedicated this new team to, and that's what we became our motto at the agency. So you had a customer service focus. You made internal changes involving staff, telework, executive teams. Talk a little bit more about some of those outward-facing things. What, what did the beneficiaries right. notice? What kind of changes right. did they see? So the first thing, in order to run something the size of Social Security, you absolutely have to have the proper systems. And we spent an awful lot of our uh, resources, our time, in laying out a new system plan. And I brought in from the private sector three very capable systems professionals that had done this before um, in the private sector to help our systems people. We reorganized the systems department, and we were really making a lot of inroads in improving the systems for our beneficiaries. That was the number one thing, and I think you have to be realistic. In order to run this thing, you have to have the proper systems. The problems that we had, and people don't understand, Security was so important because of obvious reasons. We had to be very careful who could enter into the system. So our biggest problem was not the systems themselves, but getting access for the beneficiary to get into the to access the system, access their account, and be able to do things online. But the bottom line was in order to fix Social Security and make this work better for the beneficiary, we needed the right systems. We needed a new website. Our website was completely out of date, so we set in motion the ability to really modernize, uh, put in a whole new website. And I don't know I should have really looked at it lately. I haven't, but I know it was underway when I left to modernize the website. And on the website, what we wanted to do was copy a lot of things I did with the thrift savings plan, which was to put proper education materials and make it so that people could learn from the website, understand what benefits they get, what benefits they didn't get, and to, to be able to access this. Another thing was, and Mark was, would talk about this, I'm sure, was the paper statements. We redid the paper statements completely, which a certain amount of our beneficiaries got, which was completely outdated. Uh, the scam campaigns, as you know, you all know about what was happening with scamming. It was a disaster, and we did a, a outreach program uh, on radio, on billboards and post offices to try and uh, get to our customers and make them aware of what was happening with the scamming. The 800 number, a very important source of, of uh, the ability for our beneficiaries to, to access the system. We put a whole new 800 system in. Uh, we put in all kinds of incentives for operators because we had to get the busy system, bu busy uh, signals, and to get the wait times down for the 800 number. Um, another thing that we worked on, we spent a tremendous amount of time on a lot of money, was outreach to vulnerable population. And this became very important when COVID hit us and the offices were closed. So we worked uh, very diligently, put together a whole team that would um, 
work hand in hand with not-for-profit organizations and charities so that they, we could help uh, individuals who cannot um, access the systems and get into Social Security and disability so that they can aid them in, in accessing the system. And we spent a whole, we built a whole department, a whole system to help doing this, and it became very important uh, during COVID. Um, another, another item, and these are all basic things that don't sound very exciting, but to the average uh, beneficiary, they were very important. We used to have a huge backlog on disability claims and hearings. So what we did was when Microsoft Team came, came on and we were a Microsoft customer, we were able to have judges. A judge in Omaha, Nebraska could try a case in Dallas, Texas. So what happened was you didn't have to depend on just the judges in the local area. You could have a judge any place doing video hearings as long as the, uh, the, um, the beneficiary agreed with it. Lock boxes, something similar to that. Do you know all, when we came into Social Security, all remittances, and believe it or not, there were a lot of remittances, billions of dollars that was paid back to Social Security for various reasons, all paper. There was no lockbox even system set up. So we put lock boxes in and we automated the remittance process. We, we had months and months of backups of paper sitting around in the Philadelphia Processing Center. So all these things sound like very esoteric, not, not, they're not major things, but together this added up to really helping the customer. Uh, the 800 number I touched on, very important. Tremendous amount of our customers access the system through the 800 number. The modernization, we put in a new system we trained the operators differently, gave them incentives in order to answer the phones. Things like that is what we focused on at Social Security. And the last thing I want to touch on, and I want to let Mark and mm -hmm. everybody else talk, but what we did was regulations, the disability regulations were really antiquated, hadn't been modernized for over 50 years. And that was something that Mark and I and the team set out to, to change. And I had the power as the commissioner to update the regulations. And uh, Mark will tell you about that. But we made many changes. Unfortunately, we weren't able to complete all of them because of uh, what happened uh, it, you know, to my term. But uh, that was another major thing to, in order to improve the hearing process. Yeah, I want you to know I'm strongly resisting the urge to make a lockbox joke here involving uh, Al Gore and you know the SNL skits from 20 years ago, but it's it's impressive that the lockbox. Yeah, it's a simple, still basic exists. thing, yep. but it's very important. <laughs> these things. Let, let's let's turn to those regulations that you mentioned. Um, so Andrew talked about the the processes behind Social Security, the, uh, the staff, the executive team, and all that. Mark, tell us a little bit about the regulations and the policy side of things. Um, how did updating policies and regulations improve customer service in addition to these other sort of process measures? Yeah, so I'll just uh, key off what, uh, what Andrew indicated. So I'll start off with the, with the statement. Um, the statement uh, uh, basically was Senator Moynihan's idea from many, many years ago. It's a great idea. It, uh, it's, it's meant to tell people what to, they can expect from Social Security in terms of their benefits based on their earnings and to make sure that their earnings record is correct because that's the basis upon which the, the benefits will be calculated. So it's a, it's a, it's a simple, basic, good idea. However, um, it had never, the, the statement as it existed hadn't been changed in 25 years. Um, it, it got very stale. People sort of you know, I mean, our research indicates that you need to change it every so often for people to actually read it. Um, also, it had gotten very cluttered, a very bureaucratic language, um, and also it was a one-size-fits-all, even though, you know, you mentioned, we keep on mentioning how many tens of millions of people and their, their varied circumstances, you can't necessarily, you know, um, you know uh, get it down to, you know, uh, people who live in Alaska 
um, and their unique circumstances, but you can get it a little more uh, targeted in terms of age groups, in terms of income groups, in terms of um, whether people work for state and local government or not, because their situations are all importantly different. And what we did is we uh, basically changed the statement so that the basic statement was a simple, direct, clean, sort of like, as Andrew indicated, like the thrift savings plan. It told, them, it told everyone really what they needed to know about their earnings and about their benefits. And then everything else was, was, uh, uh, was added in terms of what we call fact sheets. So sort of, if you, for example, if you work for state and local government where you were not covered by Social Security or partially covered, you got a fact sheet that applied to you. If you were you know, approaching retirement, you got another fact sheet. And that was, you know, gave you more information that was relevant to you in terms of uh, your, you know, your, your decisions that you would be, need to be making very soon. So, and that went up on the website. Um, and for people who still get the paper statement, they get, they get that. And also there were tools that were introduced on the website that people could um, you know, say, well, let's say I want to retire uh, this year, I want to retire that year, what is the impact of my benefits? So I think um, you know, in terms of service to the customer, in terms of basic, uh, particularly for retirement, but it also had disability and, and survivor benefits explained, it really gave them the basic understanding of what the system was about. With regard to the disability regulations, um, as Andrew indicated, they had not been changed in almost 50 years. And uh, the, the way to think about it is there's basically two main uh, entry points to, for disability. One is if, you're, if you have a disability, a sickness, an ailment that is so severe um, that you pretty much automatically get on. But still, it, it does need to be adjudicated in terms of whether you make, you make those, the, that grade. And those medical uh, factors had not been updated. They were very out of date. And medical science advances, you know, uh, new treatments are come up. And so, uh, you know, that needs to be reflected in the program. And so we did that. We did succeed that um, under Andrew's uh, uh, guidance and my, my leadership. Uh, we were up to date in terms of the medical factors. There are 14 body systems, and we, we pretty much got that up to date. Um, but the other, and actually the more important, and the majority of claims that come in are actually not just medical, they're also vocational. In other words, the person is, is not sick enough to meet those medical factors, but you know, they may not be able to work. But in order to judge whether they're able to work or not, you need to know what are the vocational requirements of work. And that data, which we got from the Department of Labor, was over 30 years out of date. Needless to say, that many jobs don't exist anymore. New jobs do exist that we didn't have. But even more importantly, the requirements of those jobs have changed. I mean, there's technology. Uh, you know, working on, a, on, the, on the factory line is different now than it was 50 years ago. And also, people are working longer in terms of their, their age and their health. We have an an older workforce, a healthier workforce, and none of that was reflected in, 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 the, uh, in the regulations. And we made one significant change, uh, which did stick, and the rest we were, were not able to complete. Uh, I'll just mention the one that we did mention, we did make, which was related to language. So the, 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 the regulation used to say that if you didn't speak English, you, after age 45, you were pretty much presumed not to be able to work. And that, that clearly you know, ran in, in the face of reality. We changed that, and, um, um, and that has stuck. But in terms of the bigger project of changing the vocational factors, we came very close. We are using data, which the agency has spent a lot of money on, um, but we have not implemented that. Let me ask both of you to kind of put that in context of where many people perceive the economy to be today, right? So, um, significant labor shortages and some concerns that there are a lot of folks who are on the sidelines, including especially folks who are disabled I, or who have disabilities that keep them from, um, from working. I presume that the changes you made were, I don't want to demission, but maybe marginal to the point of getting people back into the labor force and, and working. Um, what else is going to be needed to do that? And Andrew, I wonder if you could talk from kind of your prior perspective not just as a commissioner, but also uh, an employer for many years about the sort of disability labor shortage uh, dynamic in the country right. now. I'd like, Mark, just to focus on the, 
what we weren't able to complete, Mark, because I think that really answers the question. Maybe you could just talk about that a yeah, little bit. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think it, it, it's, it's a reality that, um, you know, when you do apply for disability, you have to indicate you're not able to work. Mm -hmm. um, and once you get onto disability, you also have to, you know, indicate you, you can earn some amount of money, but it's, it's, it's a small amount. So the whole system is once you, know, once you apply and you get on, you're saying you can't work. So it's very important, it's extremely important to, to make the correct judgment as to whether that person can or cannot work. Because once they're on, it's very difficult for them to continue. And after a period of time, their, their, their work skills atrophy and their connections and networks atrophy. So you know, this question of you know, vocational factors, in fact, is a big part of the answer to your question. Uh, because you know you want people who are disabled and are not able to work to get their benefit, but you also want people who are able to work not to get their benefit and therefore continue to, to work. And and um, you know that I think is is responsive. There's one other thing uh, that even while you're you're on, um, there are very complex rules uh, that are meant to encourage you to try to try to work. Um, However, those rules are, they're so incredibly complex that we have advisors at Social Security. I mean, these are part of the people that, you know, the 100,000 employees, and we also hire. Not only they're not employees of the federal government, but we hire people to help people understand, real people, you know, beneficiaries, understand how, how to try to, tr to get back to work. The rules are, are incredibly complex and unnecessarily so. The other thing that um, you didn't mention, Mark, which I think we should mention, is the continuing review process. So what Mark said about once you're on disability, uh, I believe it was seven years, if I remember correctly. Well, that, that was at the extreme, yeah. Extreme, that yeah. they review your medical history. Look, years ago, a lot of these diseases, people were finished. I mean, you were, they were fatal, you were disabled, you'd never be able to come back to work. But with modern medicine today, look at all the advances and how many people that were declared basically dead that now could be productive people in the workforce. So I think one of the most important things uh, going forward is to, um, to expand the continuing review process. Now, that came into a lot of headwinds from a lot of the advocacy groups, but I think it's wrong because what you have is people that can be productive members, as Mark said, of the workforce that are considered under the current um, uh, regulations and their current adjudication to be disabled, but really, in fact, if their records are looked at, they can go back to work now. I don't know, Mark, if you want yeah, to add so, something so to that this, was a, but that's an uh, important yeah, so thing. Uh, that, that actually was uh, something that we, we proposed, uh, it was, uh, and we were going to actually make changes in the proposal, but we uh, <laughs> were ushered out of office before that. So uh, it, it would have helped. It wouldn't have been a gigantic um, um, savings or a, a lot of people back to work, but it would have made a difference, absolutely. Um, so this is all great stuff. You uh, were able to achieve some of what you set out to do. You did significant improvements in terms of customer service. I finished and, business, it, Matt. It yeah. was. Right, right. So that's the question. So what weren't you able to do? So what, what was the sort of unfinished right. business you weren't able to well, complete during your I, time? I think, and you, you asked about this in the beginning, one of the things that was very important was the offices. You all know, having visited the Social Security offices, and really, to me, the offices should be the last resort uh, of a beneficiary needing help. Really, the 800 number, obviously, all the automated systems, which once fixed, people would get 90%, I hope, of their, of their questions answered either online or through the 800 number. But for those people, that needed to see an agent. And there are certain cases where you couldn't do it through the systems, you couldn't do it through the 800 number. You needed to physically be in an office for different reasons. We were gonna put in something and we were programming it at the end 
so that when we reopened the offices after the p pandemic, it would be in fact, we were gonna go to the appointment only model in the offices. And uh, basically open table, I'm sure you've all seen that. We were programming that so that somebody that needed to see an agent physically needed to go to an office, would go online, make an appointment at their local office, and be seen by an agent at a, a appointment time. Because I would never let those offices open the way they used to be. We used to have elderly people, disabled, sick people sitting around these offices. I went to so many of the offices in the morning when they opened, in the rain, cold weather, snow, ice, people waiting outside. They couldn't even get in the offices. It was ridiculous. So I wanted to go to an appointment-only model. We were programming it. I knew this would work. We watched actually the state of Maryland motor vehicle. Some of you, a lot of you probably live in Maryland. You see they have that system at the Motor Vehicle Bureau, and it's highly successful from what I, what I understand in the research we did. So we were going to go to an appointment-only model to open the offices up, which I think would have been terrific. Mark, you want to comment on sort of unfinished business? Yeah, so the, I mean, uh, certainly the vocational modernization is a, a big unfinished business. Uh, you know, it may sound uh, quaint or uh, you know, uh, small small amounts of money, but um, you know, for the agency, we we certainly uh, has spent a lot of money on getting the new data in terms of the vocational uh, uh, requirements of work, um, and uh, this was a, through the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Basically, this data costs $35 million a year, and we've been doing this survey of, of employers for many years now. Um, and then also with the, the agency, you know, under Andrews, uh, involved all the components, all the uh, uh, deputy commissioners in terms of putting this new regulation together and making the, the necessary changes, but we were not able to publish it. So I you know it's a very rough number. You know, it's a very rough number. I would say that uh, all told, the agency has spent about Five hundred million dollars on, on on a regulation which has not yet seen the light of day. So, uh, <laughs> you know, Andrew, I know you you you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Andrew and uh, Matt, uh, you, you look you look at unemployment insurance fraud, and that comes into the tens of billions of dollars. So, five hundred million dollars may not seem like a lot, but it's still the taxpayers' money. It, it is a lot, um, and so I, I think that um, is outstanding. The the other thing which I mentioned, and uh, you know, this is Matt's area, is SSI. We had proposed a number of really, I think, very nice uh, legislative uh, simplicities and improvements in the program, um, and uh, those those did not uh, did not go anywhere. Um, so I, I think there there is a lot more to do. The, the other thing, Matt, too, I think, and I said this in the beginning of my introduction. In order to really run this thing the way you want to run it, and give the service you need to give to our customer. Um, you really have to have the modern systems and systems that work for the beneficiary. Uh, Social Security, a lot of the systems, they still use cobalt systems for our basic operating systems, which we couldn't even find the people that could write the language anymore. We had to use very expensive consultants just to be able to keep the cobalt systems running. The systems work here is tremendous, and it, we really had a five-year plan. So I don't want anybody to think that all the systems were fixed. It's a, it was a five-year plan. We were spending billions of dollars a year. It was, I think, the most important thing in the long run for the Social Security Administration. We had put together a really good systems department, made a huge amount of personnel changes, very capable person running it. And I think that I don't know what's happened now, but in my mind, there's no reason why in the next two, three, four, five years, if they followed the plan that we had put in, they would have a modern, a really modern systems that work for all the beneficiaries. Let's talk for a second about how the pandemic kind of threw a wrench in things as well, right? So <laughs> along comes March of 2020, offices are shut down. Um, despite your prior concerns about too many people teleworking before, now everybody is teleworking. What was that like? What was the process of shutting down? How did you adapt 
systems to the continued right. demand for benefits, in some ways maybe right. increased demand for benefits right. given the economy and all that. How did that unfold? Well, the first thing was we obviously were concerned about the employee safety and the safety of, uh, of uh, the, the beneficiaries. So we had to shut the offices. There was, there was not even a question. Nobody would question that decision. Um, there was no vaccine then, if you remember, and it was dangerous, especially considering we were dealing with an elderly population and a population that was uh, disabled. So that had to be done. And there's no question, when we, we went to telework it, it completely in no offices, it put huge strain on the 800 number. It put huge strain on the automated systems. Thank God at that point, we were doing about 50%, I think it was 50% or even more of, of the customer work online. If we wouldn't have been at that point, we would have really had a, a, a real problem with the agency. But because so much was already put online over the years, the, the two or three years before that, we were able to sneak by. And the 800 number was, was better. It wasn't completed. We didn't have all the new uh, systems put in on the 800 number. So there's no question the service went down, the productivity went down, and certain things did back up. But, for example, in the hearings operation, which had been a problem for a long time because of Microsoft team in the video, we had people that were able to uh, have their hearings as long as they agreed from home. So we really didn't fall behind. Actually, in fact, we got a lot more done and we kept up to date than we had done in previous years. So the technology got us, got us through, but you had to have the offices open. Who really suffered was not so much the sophisticated beneficiary who knew how to go online or get the 800 number or had somebody help them do it. You know who really suffered was the uh, poor people, the people that were, um, that were not well educated, that had language problems. And that's why we set this whole department up to help those people uh, we called it the outreach programs, and that was a very important thing. Those people really suffered when the offices closed, and especially in some of the, the communities, inner city communities, um, where, where without the office, these people had no access. They didn't have their own uh, iPads and stuff, so it was very hard for them to access the system. Mark, anything to add? Yeah, so actually it's, uh, it's related to this, uh, you know, I think uh, when, when uh, you know, the, uh, the economy clo literally closed um, in March and April of 2020, we expected, uh, based on, you know, historical uh, uh, patterns, that we would get a very big increase in disability claims because obviously the unemployment rate just jumped up. And historically, when the unemployment rate goes up, people do apply for disability. Um, and, uh, men, men, you know, and, and a certain percent do get on. So that was the expectation, um, and, um, but it did not actually, was not realized, um, so, somewhat surprisingly. And, and, you know, some people, you know, indicated, well, maybe it's because we closed the offices, but, you know, the agency did react to that, as Andrew has, has, has mentioned many times, uh, with, with the, the outreach pro program. So I think a better explanation is, um, you know, there was so much money that the government has put, was putting out in terms of unemployment, enhanced unemployment, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, you know, uh, 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 stimulus payments and so on, that you know, the economic incentive to apply for disability wa wasn't there. Right. Um, I think that's the better explanation as to why that didn't occur. Um, and I'll, I'll mention one, one little uh, point um, you know, about unemployment. Um, it is the rule that you can apply for disability and still get, still have unemployment insurance, even though the, the, it's sort of contradictory because to be on unemployment, generally you have to show that you're trying to work, whereas for disability it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the rule allows it. Um, but I think many people don't understand that, don't know that. So therefore, when they were getting these generous, uh, very generous unemployment right. insurance, they probably just didn't said right. it. And, uh, yeah, and they the wouldn't dollar, apply for disability. And the dollar amounts are really kind of stunning. So, 
Congress in March of 2020 added $600 a week on every unemployment check. So the average uh, unemployment check nationwide is about 325 bucks. So you get to 925, $950 per week, as opposed to, I think the average SSI benefits eight, $900 a month, right? So uh, these are, being on unemployment was much more generous than being on disability at that point, and that continued for much of the pandemic. Right. right. So. Th there's one other thing I'd like to mention. The Social Security Administration, most people probably don't realize this, when it came to the um, emergency payments that were sent out, everybody uh, believes that the IRS actually was the one that sent the payments out. But in fact, the Social Security Administration, we spent huge amounts of time and efforts because the way the IRS has no records for those people who make under a threshold salary income a year. You know, you don't have to file an IRS return. So the government, the IRS had no records whatsoever. And some of those people obviously were the most neediest people that were in the worst shape because of COVID. Those people that didn't even make enough income to file a tax return. So where did they get the records from? Our, the IRS relied on the Social Security Administration's tapes, our, our, our tapes, and these were the most accurate because we send payments out every month to recipients. So we were the ones that every time there was one of these payments, you have no idea how much time, how much effort, and the employees did a yeoman's job getting these tapes updated over to the IRS so Treasury could issue these checks, these checks, uh, the emergency payment checks to these beneficiaries who were under the IRS threshold of income. And it mounted to, I think it was 60 million people that weren't going to get any checks because the IRS had no record to them. They didn't exist. They never filed a tax return legally, not illegally. Right. So that would be the bulk of the SSI population, people who aren't working. You're not claiming the EITC so because you're not working, so you're not known to the IRS. So right. SSA has to fill in those blanks. It was about 60 million people that were not in their records at all. Okay. So the pandemic threw a wrench into things. Um, there were other actors pushing on against your agenda as well. You want to talk about that a little bit? Unions, advocates, workforce. Um, you want to start, Mark? Yeah, I'll start. And actually, those, I'm sure Andrew will cover those, those very well. I'll, I'll sort of uh, mention some of the maybe the uh, other uh, less less known uh, but save some, actors. Save some. I definitely will save some for you, Andrew. Um, you know, within the government itself, um, uh, I would say, and I've worked in other government agencies, as you know, indicated in my in my little bio. I worked at the Treasury, at the IRS, the Federal Reserve. When I came to Social Security, I was amazed at what a fishbowl you, you are working in. Everyone is looking at what you're doing in, in great detail. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it is a democracy, and so you certainly understand the need for some of it. But it, I would say my, my experience was that it was overdone. And that's within the government, both from Congress, from, from GAO, from OMB. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of time to answer all those questions. But I think even more importantly, and this is particularly true for people who are, you know, are, are the, the staff who, who make their life work you know, at the agency, you know, over years, I think they get the message just to not to take any risks, not to, to do anything out of, out of the ordinary. So even like you know, something as simple as changing the statement, you know, until Andrew came on board, I was not making much headway with that because this, the career staff, and again, you know, they're great people. They're really phenomenal. And they, they, were, they had their heads down, and they said, um, no, that's, that's going to be controversial. So you can imagine if that's controversial, changing a disability regulation mm -hmm. is, was, really, was really hard work. Um, we were making progress, and again, the, the staff worked extremely hard on this. And, you know, that's the other thing I, I, why I feel I have a regret that it didn't go through because there were so many really smart, hardworking people at the agency who worked so hard on that. On that. But there were other impediments. I'll leave that to you, Andrew. <laughs> so I think that, you know, when you take over a huge thing like Social Security and you try and make changes in there, there's a lot of constituencies that don't like the change. 
I told you about the unions. You know, as I said, and I, I want to make this clear, we have, Social Security has a really dedicated workforce for, for the most cases. And I don't want to make it sound like I was against the workers, because that's not true. But there were X amount of people at, led by the unions, the federal unions, who, in my opinion, took total advantage of the government and the situation that was there. I mean, I'll give you one example with this telework, which really, I won't go into all the details, but it was known at the Social Security Administration, the way you do telework is you take your iPad home and you put a stapler on the spacer bar when you're doing telework, and therefore nobody will know that you're not there and you leave. And when you come back, you pull the stapler off and you're there. But it looks like you're engaged. It looks like you're working. And if you don't have the proper productivity controls, which we didn't have, no way to tell what kind of work you were doing. I mean, it was bad. And this was known by the union and made known to the employees, this is how you do telework at home. You know, these are the kind of things we had to deal with. And frankly, I was very tough on some of these unfair, in my opinion, uh, labor practices, and the union wanted me out. And the Biden administration is a pro-union operation. That's their business. That's politics. They won the election. And uh, there was tremendous pressure by the unions to remove me. Also, the advocates, like Mark said, we wanted to... And I think they read it wrong, too. With the disability population, we didn't want to knock people off the roles that weren't entitled to it. What we wanted to do was reform the roles so that those people that were receiving benefits really did deserve it. Because don't forget, for everyone that des took benefits that didn't deserve it, that hurt the people that really needed the benefits. And if you looked at what we did, Mark, am I correct? And we ran all the numbers, so many, every one of these things, believe me, you had to run everything. It wasn't less money spent, but the people, the idea was the people that deserved it got the benefits, and those that didn't were knocked off the rolls. So the advocates, I think, had it wrong, but they were against a lot of what we were doing. And... Uh, Look, I was very tough on some of these union practices that I thought were very unfair, very unfair to the agency. And, and uh, there was a difference in, obviously, feelings in the new administration. And they, they wanted me out. But the problem is, the reason the Social Security Act was signed by, by, by the way, signed by President Clinton, a Democrat, and was passed by unanimous voice vote by Congress. That's how popular it was. One of the provisions in there was the commissioner could not be removed except for cause. And they, they never uh, accused me of cause, the administration. They said we had policy differences. That's what the press secretary said at the time. But what they've done by doing that now, you have an acting commissioner there that, in my opinion, will never get confirmed. Uh, and the, 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 there, there won't be a confirmed commissioner because I think that the people of my party believe that I'm still the rightful commissioner. I was confirmed, by the way, with 77 votes at the confirmation. 35 Democrats voted for me, even though I was a Trump-appointed uh, commissioner, including uh, Leader Schumer and Deputy Leader Durbin. All these people voted for me, so it wasn't a political job. But now what you've done to the agency, this job, in my opinion, is a fiduciary job. Yeah, there's some policy things like Mark talked about, but the majority of the job is a fiduciary job. You're really running an annuity fund. People have paid into this thing, and they're getting their money back. And what they've done now is totally political criticize the agency. And I think in the end, that's a very big mistake. So um, 
uh, just uh, we're going to take a break for questions in a few minutes, but I just want to remind anybody who's watching that if you have a question, you want to submit it on Twitter, it's hashtag Social Security AEI, or email John Mantis at john.mantus at aei.org. So um, I used to work on Capitol Hill. One of the members I was privileged to work for was Sam Johnson. Sam Johnson was, in addition to a war hero, he's the long time chairman of the Fantastic. Social Security right. Subcommittee yep. um, and just a tremendous American patriot. He characterized the sort of period where we lacked an act, a, a confirmed commissioner before you were uh, nominated and confirmed as SSA being on autopilot. And it's actually kind of, you know, it's, it's disturbing, I think, in some ways, to think that going back to 2013, when Commissioner Astru um, finished his term, with the exception of your period as commissioner, we've had only acting commissioners for now coming close to a decade. Um, talk about that and the kind of leadership and the need for um, stability at the agency uh, and somebody who's in charge who's not an acting commissioner. Well, I think, first of all, in the government, you all know in these big jobs, you need to be confirmed. I think if you're not Senate confirmed, I don't think you have the authority. I don't think you have the credibility with the powers to be in Washington. I think it's very important to be a Senate confirmed commissioner. And the, it's very simple. If you look back in the history when they were writing the updated Social Security Reform Act and just before President Clinton signed it, uh, the Congress was very concerned about continuity, just what you said, that mm -hmm. They wanted to have a commission. They realize all these changes. I mean, look, if, if corporate America had a new executive all the time, I mean, what would you get? You'd have no continuity. How are you going to fix all the things that Mark and I talked about if there's nobody there, you know, that cuts through administration? So I think it's obvious, and I think it's it's... It's, it's unfortunate that this happened. I mean, I was chairman of the Federal Retirement Board. I worked for both President Obama and President Bush, who did appoint me. I was unanimously confirmed over there in that job. And I was there for nine years. And in those nine years, we were able to really change the thrift savings plan. It wasn't only me. It was the team, obviously. When I say I changed it, I, the whole group that we put together changed it. But the fact was, I was there for nine years in continuity. And I think that was really important. And unfortunately, I think if we would have had another two or three years with Mark and the rest of the team, I think you would have seen a very different Social Security Administration. I'm not going to comment on the woman that's there now. I don't think that's fair. I wouldn't do it. It's not my business. You know, I just think the way the whole thing turned out was unfortunate. Mark, any additional thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, Andrew is certainly right that the, uh, a, a uh, confirmed commissioner makes all the difference. Um, it provides the credibility in terms of the changes that need to be made. Uh, I actually will also add, actually, with regard to the trustees' report, we haven't talked much about it. Um, it's actually very important to have confirmed commissioner and confirmed public trustees, mm -hmm. which we also have not had for now for six, seven years. Um, Really, it needs, it needs the, the public needs to know that their interests are represented directly, um, both in terms of the administration of the agency, but also in terms of the, the, um, the estimates and the, and the projections of you know, where this, this program is going in the, in the future. So I, I think it's very unfortunate that we have so many acting. And I'll also add, actually, it, it's a very uh, unfortunate uh, set of circumstances with regard to the current acting commissioner is that she was appointed under the Social Security Act. And so if President, for example, if President Biden continues um, and gets reelected, she actually can stay in that position for the entire eight years without being confirmed. Um, it's a very strange result. It's exactly the opposite of what the act itself really envisioned. So we're, we're in a, we're in a, in, in a, not, a not a good position. Let's, uh, let's take up your charge and think about the future a little bit. So um, what problems with the agency exist, uh, and what will be the impacts on beneficiaries and taxpayers headed into the future? Just a couple of examples. And without getting into solvency, which is the next question we'll, we'll, we'll touch on at the end. 
Well, you know, I want to come back to something with regard to disability and, and what Andrew said in terms of the advocates. Um, I don't know if they understood or didn't understand, and maybe they were being a little disingenuous in terms of their, some of their claims about what we were doing. But the reality is the law, which is the law, and we were not changing it, was you cannot be uh, bumped off the rolls, the disability rolls, if your health is not improved. Uh, only if your health is improved. We weren't going to change that law. So, um, the, you know, in terms of the uh, enhancement, in terms of the uh, uh, continuing disability re reviews, it was not going to have this massive change, um, you know, that the advocates were, were talking about like that had happened in the Reagan administration. That was simply, I think, dishonest by, by those advocates to raise that as a possibility. Um, you know, with regard to the bigger issue of the disability vocational regulation, I mean, that's a more significant change, but also something that would happen very gradually over time. Um, and it really would, re would relate to the reality of what work is in the, in the, in the modern economy. So it was not, it was not a radical uh, change. It was, a, it was a modernization. It was an update. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, Mark, I might interrupt for a second because, Matt, I think that everybody feels... We all know Social Security, and by the way, Social Security administers Medicare also, which we didn't even talk about, and disability and SSI. So the programs are enormous. It's like 100, was 100 million people affected. But you know what? I found that actually Congress and the administrations, they really stay away from the place. It's like the, you know, there's a joke. Social Security Administration is the third, third rail in politics, the electric third rail. Nobody wants to get involved. Nobody wants to touch it. You can't believe how little interest there actually is, even with all the talk about Social Security. So there's going to have to be interest because there's going to have to be changes to the solvency part of the plan in the future. My guess the politicians will avoid it like the plague until it becomes absolutely necessary to do it. I just don't think, in my experience as commissioner, you know, people, a lot of these congressmen, senators, when I used to call, because when we had the COVID, we were short funds. I mean, there's no question we needed more money because our productivity went way down for the reasons Mark and I talked about. And <laughs> you, you can't believe how little interest there basically was from the politicians, from the Hill, from the White House. Just people don't want to, everybody thinks this is, wow, this is like, you know, the hottest issue. But it isn't. They don't want to touch it. And they don't want to fund it anymore either. They want it to go along. It is what it is. Best thing to do is avoid it. All right, we'll, we'll get back to solvency in just a second. Let me throw one more thing at you. On this very stage, but three months ago, uh, Senator Mitt Romney talked about his proposal to reform the child tax credit. And one of the features of that proposal that gets very little attention is the fact that not only would he make it uh, payable on a monthly basis, but it would be payable by the Social Security Administration. That would, pay, that would result in something like 65 million children receiving checks every month from the Social Security Administration, which by my calculation would roughly double the number of people receiving monthly payments by SSA. Talk a little bit about that and what that challenge would look like and how that would affect the sort of core mission of the agency now. Well, not only Senator Romney, but the Biden administration, as you know, with a lot of these changes they wanted to do, they wanted Social Security to run it. My opinion right now, Social Security needs X amount of years to straighten out its own house. And as I said, the systems changes don't come easily. They're really expensive. And I would be against anything that throws a burden on the Social Security Administration now. It's tough enough for them to complete their daily tasks, especially with the COVID situation that was thrown on. And I wouldn't want to put any more strain on it now, Matt. Mark? Well, you know, uh, one of the areas that I was responsible for was something called data exchange where we, we exchange uh, data with other, other entities, including other government uh, uh, agencies, including the IRS. And uh, I don't know the details of this, this uh, proposal, uh, but my 
gut is the data is not there to run the program. Certainly, SSA does not have the data. That I can say flat out. And I'm not sure where it, that data exists within the government, um, how accurate it is. Um, and it needs to be accurate, as you know, as Andrew indicated, is because you don't want spending, you don't want to send the money to somebody who does not deserve it according to the law. They, SSA is very good at that. And um, uh, we haven't had the scandals of unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. And so that's the culture of the agency, and it's a good culture. And uh, my understanding is that the data is simply not there to, to do that for those, these, these proposals. Okay, so let's wrap up on solvency. So Andrew's skeptical that Congress is going to do anything until we hit the, uh, you know, the 11th hour in 2034, 2035, uh, depending on how you view the, the trustees report. Mark, what do you think? Well, just a couple of things. And one is I think it's going to happen sooner than what was in the trust, this last trustees report because I think there were a couple of assumptions that were made in that trustees report which were very optimistic in terms of low inflation, uh, very high birth rate. Um, so I think it'll happen sooner. Um, but it, it's not going to happen tomorrow, so I, I acknowledge that. Um, I think the bigger um, uh, uh, forcing event will be the budget, the general federal budget. We're in, we're in big trouble on the budget. Um, interest rates have gone up a lot. Um, and, um, and tax re receipts are, certainly are going to go down, you know, with this impending recession. That, it's going to be a very bad budget situation. And it, that's even beyond, that's in addition to what is already forecasted from Social Security and Medicare. So I think that the budget will be the forcing event, and uh, Social Security is part of the budget. Right. Well, and, and the other thing about it is 2034 is one thing. That's when the trust funds run out. But each additional year going up to that, the rest of the government is, in effect, increasingly subsidi subsidizing exactly Social Security. Right. So it gets worse and worse as it goes. Exactly. Andrew, last word on that? Um, no, I think I, I, just, I just feel, having been there and know the attitude until it's necessary, I just don't think you... I think you're kidding yourselves if you're going to see major changes in the solvency part of the program. It's too bad, too, because... I think it could be fixed relatively easy. You have to make, obviously, a series of changes, but you can do it with young people before they get, you know, to their closer to their retirement age, so nobody's really hurt so severely. But it is what it is. That's the political realities, and I think that's where it is. Right. Yeah, and that's been sort of the way these reforms have happened in the past, right? Like, the sooner you implement changes, the more gradually you can make the changes so they're, right. they're less onerous on any uh, given individual. Right. right, but I felt from, look, I couldn't control the solvency issue. So what I felt I could do with our team was what we talked about, good customer service, responsible to the beneficiaries, making sure the system was adequately funded and run on a daily basis. That's what we could control. The politicians and the politics has to take care of the solvency problem. Okay. All right. With that, let's open it up to questions. Gentleman here. Just if you could wait for the mic. Uh, the only rule is please make your question in the form of a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Leon Peace. Um, what do you think of the efforts and the interest in privatizing Social Security? I'll take it. If I, um, I, don't, I don't think it's an idea that... Uh, I think we have to be very careful with it because you... I learned one thing. We have half the recipients have no other income. And if anything were to happen to those checks... You're talking about starvation for a lot of people not being able to buy groceries. I'm a real capitalist. I'm a real Republican. I believe in the enterprise system. I would like to see everybody have the chance to invest and do better than the rate that they get, the interest rate they get on Social Security. 
but I think you have to be really careful. Maybe there's a way to do it with certain high income recipients of Social Security, but I think for the average person and certainly the lower income, lower educated part of our population, we have to be really careful with this. And I think there may be a place to do it. You know, you have to figure it out where people could tolerate the risk that are, that are higher income uh, earners and so forth. But you got to be really careful here. I'll add something. And actually, this will be a point actually of disagreement with Andrew. We actually did some research, uh, very careful research, um, using some data that we actually got from the IRS. And what we found was that the statistics that have been used, about you know, half the population is whole, always dependent, 100% dependent on Social Security. But with th statistics like that, it's very much overstated. When you look at the actual uh, income tax returns, and you include their pensions and their 401k plans and so on, the proportion is much lower than what has been uh, was stated, which the ARP still states totally incorrectly. Um, it's, it's more like, uh, it's a significant part of the population. It's more like an eighth or a sixth of the population. So changes need to be made with those, that population in mind. But also I think with the realization that people do get retirement income from, from retirement plans and including 401ks and, and you know, I think personal retirement accounts could be part of the solution for Social Security. I wouldn't call it privatization, but I think it, it could be part of the solution. So uh, an online viewer asks, why hasn't anyone brought a lawsuit against the SSA for removing a Senate-confirmed commissioner against the Social Security Act? Okay. Um, I looked at it very carefully with my wife, who's sitting right over here. And, you know, the only way to redress the situation was to go into federal court, obviously and to go into district court, and it, I'm sure it would have, I'm sure if we won in district court, it would have gone in the, the uh, claims court. If it did, I think the administration, the Justice Department would have appealed it, and this case would have gone to the Supreme Court. And quite frankly, I think it would be a very difficult, ugly fight, and I just, didn't think that it was good for the agency, it wasn't good for my family, and I didn't want to do it. So I really had no choice uh, in the matter except to go into federal court, which my family chose not to do. Okay. Uh, Mark, this must be for you because this is really weedy. Um, what systems, <laughs> what systems were, no, no offense, Andrew, what systems were implemented to conduct internal audits and penetration testing? Would you elaborate? I'm not sure actually I understand the question, to be okay. honest. Okay, all right, then yeah. we'll skip that one. Yeah. All right, unless, Andrew, you wanna? It's beyond me. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, this is for the commissioner. Um, the windfall elimination provision, WEP, seems like a really solid example of how a lack of timely education makes beneficiaries feel like the impact of a policy is unfair when, it's actually, when it actually operates to keep the system fair for everyone paying in. How do you see broader and more effective public education as part of the systems modernization work you describe as a priority? Yeah, well, I think the education, if you look back what we did at the Thrift Savings Plan and you look at all the information that's come out of there, I didn't do it, but we had a team there that believed in this, and if you pull up the website, the Thrift Savings Plan website, or you get some of their paper statements, they're unbelievable, the education there, and helping you plan your retirement, and, and what, how to invest. They don't tell you how, what to invest in. They give you the tools so you can make your own decision. I think that's so important, because as we've stated here all, all afternoon, Social Security, Medicare, these are very disability, SSI, these are very important parts of an individual's income for a lot of people, their retirement, their future retirement, and I think they need to have the tools to understand it. I think one of the biggest failings of Social Security now 
is the education materials, but you need a new website to do it properly. You needed the new paper statements, which Mark were working on, so that somebody can easily access this thing and get the information so that they can make proper decisions. I think it's all important, and whatever happens going forward, whoever's running the agency, I hope the education materials is their priority, because it was going to be ours, definitely. So on that, on that exact on point, that. I think we did make some progress. So, you know, I mentioned the statement. Um, you know, in the old statement, that, that whole issue of WEP, which, you know, applies to, uh, uh, you know, about a, a quarter of the state and local government work, workforce, uh, was like a little, little tiny little footnote. It was a sort of a little box. It wasn't very well explained, and it was, it was obscure. And um, so what we did is we took it out, and you know, not everyone, it, it doesn't apply to 90, 95% of the population, but the percent of the population that it does apply to, and we know who they are, they got a full explanation, a full fact sheet, um, including an explanation of why the rule is what it is. It is a matter of fairness because otherwise it is a windfall if, if, if there's not an adjustment made to the benefit. So we explain that. Hopefully people read it. Hopefully they understand it. I, I, I can't say you know, that it's a, a total explanation of, of it, uh, uh, you know, a total solution to the problem of misunderstanding. I think another thing which we, we looked into and it was a very surprising legal determination is um, we cannot get Social Security from the IRS the 10, um, the, uh, I guess they're 1099s, uh, is that the form? Basically, which gives you your, uh, which tells us what, what your pension income is. Social Security cannot get that, even though it's relevant to the proper benefit and the proper tax, uh, that is, you know, that is uh, income tax that is paid on Social Security benefits. According to the, our general counsel, that was not, not allowed. And according to the IRS, that was not allowed. So unfortunately, what it means is that the Social Security has to try to ferret out the pension income and make sure that the benefit is correct, uh, calculated correctly. And it's very unfair because some people are not honest in reporting that, that income. Okay. Other questions? Margie. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Thank you guys for being here. Um, you, you've talked a little bit about uh, some of the technological challenges that Social Security has. Uh, I know the telephone system is, you know, getting the new national unified system, but what is it going to take for you guys to move, or for Social Security to move away from the COBOL system? I mean, I feel like that thing's about as old as I am. Well, here's the thing. They have to move away from the COBOL system because, first of all, <laughs> in a matter of years, there's going to be nobody there to maintain it or really un can write the language. So it isn't even a question. They're going to move away from it. But if you look at the priorities, some of the cobalt systems that were there were not emergency things that had to be changed right away. There were other priorities that were, believe it or not, more important than changing the cobalt. So the question was, did you work on the access part of the system, wasn't that more important than changing the COBOL right now, which was functioning and working and you could keep it going. That's all it was. But it has to be changed. It's going to be gone. It's got to be gone. There's not going to be anybody to write the thing. I'll add something. You know, as, as was mentioned, I was on the Social Security Advisory Board. And so already 10, almost 15 years ago, we were raising the issue a cobalt with the agency. And I will say that at that time, they said, oh no, we can still do it. Fortunately, they've come around and said, no, we can no longer. Yeah, we've gotten rid of a lot of the old cobalt legacy systems. I don't want you to think they weren't. And when I was there, we were dropping them, we were getting rid of them. But there were a lot of legacy cobalt systems that weren't gonna go away tomorrow. And it wasn't necessary. As long as you had a plan, and in the five-year plan, we were going to phase them out. Other questions? Okay, well, we have a couple minutes. Gentlemen, last thoughts? Uh, I will say, you know, despite the, the frustrations and the, and the uh, you know, uh, uh, lack of progress in certain areas, uh, Working at Social Security in my position as Deputy Commissioner was the best job I've ever had. It's uh, really, uh, 
it's a place where it really, where what you do really matters. Mm -hmm. That's well said, Mark. I agree, and I'd like to echo that. I mean, I uh, I wish I had the opportunity to finish what we laid out. I know if I would have had another, not even three or four years, another two years, I think it would have been a very different place. And I think we had the team in place to do it, and I would have made sure it got done. And I feel badly that I couldn't have finished this and got the same results that I did at the Federal Retirement Board because I saw with having the time there what we have and what's left there. The, mil the military and the civilian workforce have really one of the best 401k plans in the country. I think that's universally agreed to. Low cost, well run, and I think maybe we couldn't have done exactly that at Social Security, but we could have made it a lot better. And uh, I hope the people there can continue on and get it better. I wish them the best. Um, I'm just, I feel very badly that I wasn't able to complete the job. Well, let's wrap up on that hopeful for the future <laughs> note that uh, hopefully others will take up the banner that you guys started with and bring it to completion. So uh, please join me in thanking Mark and Andrew. Thank you.